Hello and welcome to Chapter 51 Disaster Response Lecture. A main function of EMS is responding to disasters. A disaster is any event that causes or has a, the potential to cause injury or death, destruction, and distress. A disaster can be man-made or natural, and disasters overwhelm EMS and community resources because critical infrastructure has been damaged or destroyed. So let's get started. As an introduction, responding to disasters is a main function in EMS. So the definition of disaster, and we said it on the last slide, and that is a sudden event, such as an accident or catastrophe, that causes great damage, loss, or destruction. It can be man-made or natural, and it overwhelms the EMS and community resources. Critical infrastructure has been damaged or destroyed, including electrical power grid or communication systems, fuel for vehicles and drinking water and sewage removal. Also, sometimes transportation systems in hospitals and food. So anything that overwhelms EMS and community resources in smaller rural services is considered an, a disaster. Disaster management requires planners to look at preparedness, planning, training, response, and after action reviews. Disaster response planning, so EMS plans to manage disasters. Plans should be uh, suited to the geography and population and the potential risks of that specific um, area. The best way to plan for a disaster is to think what could happen here and what plans do we have in place for the possibility. An all hazards approach is the act of conducting comprehensive planning for all types of disasters. General considerations must be addressed before specifics are planned, so the number of personnel needed, equipment required, and which hospitals to transport. So phases of disaster response plan. So there's keys to planning the disaster, and those are thinking, meeting, and brainstorming. There are three phases of any response plan, and that's before the event. So that's the planning phase, during the event, and after the event. Before the event, planning is a process for preparing for potential events. No disaster is predictable, but some events are more likely to happen in certain areas such as a snowstorm in the Northwest or a tornado in the Midwest. An all hazards approach will put your agency in the best position to handle any disaster. The main items to consider when planning for a disaster include the geography of the response area. Is the area prone to a particular type of disaster? And are there obstacles and terrain features that can affect response and hinder access to equipment and maybe the entry to a facility? Okay, so the population is also a consideration. And is the population spread out or densely packed or maybe mixed? Is there a daytime population in the area as uh, well as the nighttime population? Are there language differences or cultural aspects to consider? And are there different facilities that may present hazards or evacuation issues, such as retirement communities or prisons or handicapped facilities? EMS resources, so items needed to respond effectively and efficiently to any incident may include additional staff or personnel, specialized staff or medical supplies and equipment to handle tasks. So agencies might have mutual aid agreements, and this is also known as an automatic aid agreement. And um, agencies may have disaster stashes, and these are supplies on hand for uh, just emergencies. And the inventory is kept up to date. So agencies may have access to special transportation equipment. Um, and in the event of the GPS loss, um, or if it loses satellite connection, paper maps and uh, lap maps may be needed or um, and they may be needed to be used. Partnership with private businesses. So what supplies and expertise are available from the private sector in your response area? Non-governmental organizations and disaster relief agencies. So an example could include Salvation Army and Red Cross and your agency will determine the best way to contact these organizations. Law enforcement resources. So um, your disaster response plans must also take into account state, regional, 
or county and local law enforcement resources and their goals and objectives. Fire and rescue response. So the disaster response plan will outline fire and rescue response. It's important to have drills on a unified command system within the incident community command system and understand how your agency will work within a unified command structure. Training standards. Uh, so training is usually done in phases following a set process. Agencies frequently update and train on procedures to follow during a disaster, personal protective equipment, and safety procedures. Also infrastructure. You so familiarize yourself with your agency's communication backup plan. Telephone landlines may go down and then cell phone towers may be overwhelmed. So include backup procedures such as vehicle fueling in the event of a power outage. Internal communication. So there should be a plan to maintain communication with all members for your agency. Hospitals and healthcare systems. So familiarize yourself with the level of care available in your area. You may participate in drills with local hospitals and there may be agreements in place to provide personnel um, at your agency or theirs. And then media organizations. So there should be training um, with the public information officer within your agency and have a backup public information officer. Incident escalation. So know when and how to contact the next higher level of authority. There should be a list within your agency and dispatch system with contacts at the state and federal levels and redundancy is built into the plan. The system should be tested at least semi-annually and know what steps to take to ensure higher levels of authority know who you are and where you are and what you're doing. Okay, so immunizations and personnel keep immunizations up to date. The designated control officer or services uh, medical director should know the health status of all employees and be familiar with your agency's plan of inoculations persistent to a specific emergency. Sheltering and protection. So plans will include information on sheltering community members and personnel, and the plan will include information on supplying food, water, waste disposal, and bathroom facilities. Also animal control. So if an agency is assisting in evacuations, address animals such as pets that must be left behind. Rural areas must have precautions to manage the carcasses. There should be plans with concerns pertaining to zoo, areas of zoo, wildlife refugees, and veterinarian facilities. And then during the event. Okay, so that's what we're gonna talk about next. That was before the event, now this is gonna be during. It's best to stick to a plan, but changing conditions and oversight and plea planning may require modification. You may have advanced warning of the upcoming event, such as a tornado or an ice storm. Considerations during the disaster include inventory. During the alert or preparation period, take an immediate inventory of supplies on hand and anticipate what you will need determine how much space is available, and a mobilization of personnel. So gather the crew and activate the notification system. Personnel must be briefed and notified of changes of the plan. Agencies will assign jobs as needed, and the agency will start an IS-211 form that tracks the personnel. If this includes who reported and when and where they were assigned have consistent and continual inventory of where people are and what they're doing. And every paramedic must have the necessary credentials on his or her person. Command and setup. So command must be visible and unified command. So fire, police, EMS, and other agencies should, should be represented in the command structure. A lead agency directs the efforts and cooperation is essential. Personnel, protective equipment, and safety equipment. So PPE must be replaced immediately as needed, and personnel must not take shortcuts to neglect to wear the gear that they are assigned. Equipment resupply. So equipment can wear out, break, or expend during crisis. 
so new incoming personnel may not use the same equipment and may need to be trained. Triage classification, so patient classification may be disaster dependent, and these are constant and ongoing depending on patient's need and the, av the availability, safety, and sustainability of EMS providers. Also, there needs to be patient tracking. So you must make a record for every patient you see or assist during the event. And you must complete a patient care report for patients you transported. The transport supervisor must maintain a log of the patients and the hospitals they're transported to. So information you must collect and give to the incident commander includes the patient's names, injury categories, which units transported, and where the patients were transported. And then the assignment of personnel. So assess. New resource personnel must be done before they begin and choose appropriate personnel for patient care demands on several factors. So choose them on the level of training, the duration, and the amount of stress related to the event. Personnel physical needs. So patients and personnel need to eat, drink, and use the restroom. So in long-lasting incidents, personnel will require areas to sleep, assess their medications, and ways to communicate to their loved ones. Personnel mental health needs, so use the buddy system, an approach to monitor stress, exhaustion, aggravation, and burnout. Uh, provide downtime in areas where EMS workers can unwind. EMS providers are encouraged to talk about their experiences, but be on alert for uh, mental health issues and incident fatigue. Hospital updates, it's important to maintain communication with those facilities, and so hospitals may be able to resupply your equipment and supplies. You need, uh, you may need help and get some of the personnel, and they may need help um, from you. So keep hospitals updated on field conditions. Providing and accepting relief. So your agency must ensure there is enough coverage in its home area if it is providing relief. Make sure the equipment is capable before you go, and the rules apply in reverse if your agency is accepting relief. Also with surveillance, in a terrorism event, suspicious people and packages should be reported. So report on evolving trends of diarrhea, vomiting, and rashes during flooding environment can assist with disease monitoring. And then during the event, there's the weather condition. Weather is the cause of many disaster events, and it can significantly affect the ability of EMS to provide care during and after the event. So monitoring is critical for proper deployment, operation, and protection of the EMS responders. Key items to consider include time for the event, um, areas uh, that's been affected, population affected, and special hazards that may be triggered. In the media, so members of your agency may be trained to respond to questions from the press and measures to control rumors. A press area may be necessary and use the press to your advantage. And legal issues. So proper documentation during a crisis is essential. Most legal issues will resolve long after the event. And all patients who are transported should have a patient care report written. Unit leadership reinforcement, so a commander or supervisor should perform uh, occasional field checks. A strong concern until commander can do a lot to bolster the morale. Um, many issues can be resolved with early intervention. After the event, there are specific measures to take after an event. Considerations include accountability, so agencies must account for every worker and patient involved. Duty rosters must be completed for each EMS provider, and a patient care report or triage tag is required for every patient seen, transported, or assisted. You want to resupply and repair, so all equipment used in the event, and check that all equipment that was used was not weathered or contaminated and then repair the equipment if needed and service vehicles that were used. An inventory, so complete an inventory of all physical uh, assets after the resupply and repair. 
stress reaction review so with it long-term events or high mortality rate events consider using critical stress management teams um, concerns should be reported immediately in line with your agency's employee assistant program or critical incident stress debriefing plan open communication should be encouraged physical exam of personnel so a physician should examine all injured personnel the EMS providers should be notified of test results as soon as they're possible, and uh, counseling services should be made if um, available, if requested or required. And then brainstorm. So the agency should solicit input from the staff when evaluating the response to the disaster. It makes EMS providers stakeholders in the event. And after the action report, so the official internal report of an entire event. It should contain a chronological and accurate description of the facts of the incident. It can be used to provide retraining in a specific area. When it comes to finance and reimbursement, government organizations or insurance may cover money spent on equipment, personnel, and loss in large incidents. A declaration of a disaster may open the door for state and federal disaster relief funds, and low interest loans. So acknowledgement, a good performance should be praised. So EMS providers feel good about their service. Award dinners and plaques help increase morale and retention of personnel. Okay, so let's talk about natural disasters. So there are two types of disasters, natural and man-made. Some disasters are a combination of both. For example, riots and looting may occur after a hurricane. When it comes to natural disasters, drivers of emergency vehicles should understand braking differences and traction problems when driving in inclement conditions. EMS should be represented both in the Emergency Operations Center, so the EOC, and in Unified Command. EMS may be initially deployed to assist in evacuation efforts and emergency reports should be coordinated with local and state departments of transportation or public work agencies. Landmarks may be gone. Use light to direct displaced people towards emergency services. Radio communication and cell phones will likely be unreliable. And dignitaries may visit the site of the event for various reasons. EMS duties may be expanded for standard practice to deliver or administer medications or perform other related health, public health services. When it comes to forest and brush fires, EMS considerations for forest, brush, and lightning strike fires are remember that you are not there to fight fire. Lightning can be dangerous and try to predict what injuries you'll be treating. So for firefighters, it might be smoke inhalation or exhaustion. And for civilians, it might be exposure or burns or exhaustion or smoke inhalation. PPE should include proper gear in addition to infection control gear. So maybe um, an air purifying respirator or heavy duty gloves or extinguishers to, um, and protective blankets. Follow directions of the fire command and stay in touch at all times with the command post. Expect cardiac events in firefighters, even those who appear young and healthy. Snow and ice storm. So make sure agency vehicles are snow ready. Carry snow shovels in the ambulance in case you need to dig a path. And to provide traction, carry the following on the ambulance. Clay kitty litter or calcium chloride crystals or rock salts. Points to remember when working in snow and ice storms, our clothing should be weather ready. Your agency may have equipment like snowmobiles or snow blowers or plows. So you also need to take your time because stretchers don't roll well in snow and you may not be able to park close to the scene. Basket stretchers such as Stokes litters will be helpful and make sure your crew has enough people. Look at the roof for snow and ice slides before entering structures. And if your company is on standby, prepare portable warm-up shelters. When it comes to tornadoes, maintain supplies in tornado-proof shelters. 
During the event, keep crews in tornado-proof shelters as well. And after the event, be ready to stage in directed area to wait for instructions. Important points to remember when working in tornadoes include helicopter and air assets will probably not be available. After the tornado, landmarks will be gone and you may need to help set up field hospitals and first aid stations at casualty collection points. Okay, so when it comes to hurricanes, usually not, uh, but not always, there is some type of warning. So there are five categories for hurricanes, in, uh, including category one, and cat, um, all the way through category five. So category five winds are greater than 155 miles an hour. Severe damage is expected. Always plan for at least one level higher than the worst category predicted. Safety is always a first. So you cannot help if you're injured. If you are told to hunker down, do it. You may be able to use the time before the storm hits to fill sandbags and restock equipment. In addition to PPE, make sure you have um, weather gear and personal flotation devices. Most patients' care will come after the storm, so stay updated on post-storm failures, levees that are overcome, or bridges and roads that are flooded. If you don't know the depth of the water, do not drive through it. When it comes to tsunamis, so tsunamis are tidal waves and um, they're large waves that travel thousands of miles and hit the shore at speeds of 500 to 600 mile per hour or more. There um, can be very little time, if any, for advanced preparation. Your personal safety is, is essential and it is safe to assume that nothing the water hits will survive. So bring all of your vehicles uphill and inland and make as many supplies as or take as many supplies as you can with you. Tsunamis can come in a series. So even if additional tsunamis are less severe, your first line defense will probably be overwhelmed. The following are important points relating to EMS response and tsunamis. So pay strict attention to the warning systems in place and comply with instructions. Those who have drowned will likely be dead at the time by EMS arrival. Your agency should plan to set up temporary morgue sites and you cannot respond until the tsunami is, uh, has done its damage. Earthquakes, so there's not gonna be, uh, there'll be little or no warning depending on the size, duration, and strength. They can cause thousands of deaths and billions of dollars worth damage within minutes. Aftershocks occur regularly and can be substantial and may last for days. The biggest immediate danger comes from the structural collapse. Severed gas lines, electrical power lines, and fuel tanks can also contribute to fires. Important po points relating to EMS response to earthquakes include, if you have advance warning, your building and the vehicle contents should be secured. During and after the earthquake, roads will likely be damaged and or cut off, and dust suffocation can occur during the quake. It's caused by particles of dust and debris loosened and released into the air. If you're responding to patients at scene of a building collapse, leave the rescue to train rescue personnel. Rescuers will need ongoing rehab, so if possible, have extra food and water available and call your local hospitals to find out if they are able to receive patients. When you're out in the field, take notes of all the hazards. And if your local hospital, schools, and buses, government offices, or fire departments participate in regular earthquake drills, try to be part of them. When it comes to landslides, avalanches, and mudslides, there are many reasons for landslides, avalanches, and mudslides, severe winter storms, heavy rainfall, or wildfires, perhaps flash flooding, or hurricanes. And so important points related to EMS response to these events include cliffs, high hills, and anything in the gravity path of the landslide, avalanche, or mudslide will obviously be in the danger area. When a landslide occurs, um, it, is, it can cause 
such a buildup of soil and vegetation that it can block a stream or river. So you, you may need to consider putting water rescue procedures in place. Underground piping, conduit for electrical lines and telephone lines can be damaged. So mudslides or mud flows are similar to a river of concrete. B, the intense heat of brush fires uh, seals the, oil, the soil surface, making mudslides and avalanches and landslides move even faster over terrain. Equipment that may be planned for in advance should include backhoes and earth movers. Okay, so when it comes to cavens, the bedrock that uh, is not as important as consideration as it is the actual soy, soil composition. So cavens can be caused by rapid freezing and thawing or heavy rain or excess vibration such as the, that associated with earthquakes and tremors. There are considerations for EMS personnel at um, during a cave-in. So check uh, with your local utility company to make sure power lines are not severed or unstable. And watch for loose rock in the collapse areas. So there are almost always be an accumulation of water. So be prepared to treat patients for hypothermia. There are three ways to secure the area for evacuation. So there's sloping, benching, and shoring. The atmosphere in the cave-in is generally toxic, so if the patient care area is located in the collapse area, continuously monitor for carbon monoxide or hydrogen sulfide gas or oxygen levels. And cave-ins can release sewer and chemical gases, so after atmosphere security, consider positive pressure ventilation. Okay, so next we're going to talk about volcanic eruptions, the primary emergency from the uh, explosion. So the explosion that occurs in the um, bubbling magma. So lava flow is rarely a problem as its course is slow and predictable. Since volcanic eruptions occur at the height, rescue workers may be affected by secondary problems such as melting ice or snow or landslides. Identify buildings that are in the volcano proof during pre-planning, and this should include your squad building. Are there warning, warning systems in place? So considerations when responding to a volcanic eruption include um, the population and where it's located and warning if it's a uh, non-existent, panic may spread. So expected injuries include burns, respiratory problems, or crushed trauma injuries. And ashfall is the residue left behind from the eruption. Ashfall can cause inhalation injuries, so masks should be issued to everyone. The weight of the ash can cause roof to collapse and drive carefully because ash can make roads slippery. Try to make the public aware of the importance of wearing respiratory protection even after the initial danger has resolved. Okay, so the next disaster we're gonna talk about is flooding. And most preparations for flooding occur during pre-planning. Issues to watch out for include um, slow de degradation of the levees and debris flow and a sudden ca catastrophic degradation of levees. Additional water or, or additional considerations include to wear proper wet gear. Uh, driving through water can be challenging. So walking in water that is over six inches deep will likely result in a fall and you may be swept away. So when the water starts to recede, contaminants and residue can cause serious health problems. When it comes to sandstorms and dust storms, so most problems associated with sandstorms are related to the abra abrasive and visual effects. EMS considerations for responding to a sandstorm or dust storm include sensory and eye protection, and do not rub your eyes, nose, or skin during the sandstorm. Respiratory protection should be used, and lip balm as well as some kind of cloth barrier over your whole head is a good idea. So driving is a challenge and blowing sand may hit objects. Okay, so the next disaster we're gonna talk about is the drought. 
It's caused by a lack of water available to the public, primarily based on the lack of participation over a length of time. It causes a myriad of problems for a medical community and security of the agency's working water supply. So civil unrest could spread if townspeople think EMS crews have water. So prolonged cold weather, uh, cold stress can develop. And cold stress is a condition that occurs when someone is exposed to cold weather for long periods of time, even though sheltered. Cold stress is similar to seasonal affective disorder. If maintenance or repair issues can wait until warmer weather, uh, let them and try to limit physical demands if possible. Additional considerations for working in prolonged cold weather include to dress loosely and in layers, and if you have to do standbys, try to switch crews frequently. Keep an eye on the older EMS providers. They do not handle the cold as well as the younger ones. Okay, so when it comes to heat wave, EMS personnel are very cognizant of three main types of heat injury in patients, so heat cramps, heat exhaustion, heat strokes, um, but EMS personnel are less familiar with working in these conditions every day. So there are some problems and potential solutions to issues that occur during the heat wave. So vigilance is the key. Do not wait until you feel thirsty to consume water. Small frequent meals are better than large ones and set up water trains. So as you empty your water bottles, have them refilled. Use air conditioning in buildings and vehicles. Place wet towels on your head or body to reduce body temperature and try to break up work schedules during the hottest part of the day. Meteors and space debris. So space debris or space junk burns up when entering the atmosphere. Um, and space junk is considered, it can be any man-made material or meteors are generally stones with a high content of iron. Most space debris and large meters coming from space can be detected. So keep an open mind when a patient has a history of sudden sharp pain with local bruising. When it comes to pandemics, an epidemic is the situation that occurs when an illness affects a disproportionately large number of people in a specific gener um, geographic area at the same time. A pandemic is an epidemic that occurs over an extensive area. So personal uh, protective from the disease is the most important consideration, such as N95s or respiratory protection, hand washing and sanitation. And um, the best method of detecting disease in workers is direct observation. So if someone appears sick, that person should be pulled from duty. A person can transmit a sneeze or cough from a distance of six feet. In a pandemic situation, the full workforce may not be present. The public should be instructed on how to care for sick people. Your agency should set up guidelines for which emergencies you will respond to and which calls you will wait. Um, your agency may have to set up field hospitals or care stations, and your agency may be called on to become a point of distribution for medicine or vaccinations. Okay, so some man-made disasters include structure fires. So structure fires have a much higher death and injury rate than wildfires. They occur in populated areas and involve products of combustion that can be explosive, toxic, or fast spreading. Uh, so let the firefighters fight the fire. Your agency must ensure that it has someone in a unified command who will have face-to-face -face contact with command as the events materialize. Additional key points for EMS response include watching for falling or collapsed items, uh, collapsing. So prepare to treat burns and respiratory problems, stay upwind, be prepared to evacuate quickly, and be ready for cardiac events. So construction failures and building collapse. EMS crews and agencies must be ready to handle engineering failures. As part of planning, check out new construction areas and take note of conditions and placement of equipment such as trains and update plans frequently. Consider what special PPE might be needed such as helmets, steel-toed boots, eye protection, knee 
pads and heavy duty work gloves. Other considerations when responding to include if there is a lack or lockout tagout information sh sheet on site, review it. So during response, crews may be called on to do perimeter search for patients. When victims are brought to you, collect as much information as possible and document this info on a patient care report or triage tag. Include rescuer names. You may need to supply backboard straps and Stokes basket to the rescuer, so careful thought is required to find the safest area for triaging and treatment. It should be in the cold zone. Power failures and disruptions. So if your squad building has electric locks on the doors or equipment rooms, the agency should consider getting a manual override device. Have alternate sources for heating and cooling if fluids and medications are stored in agencies, refrigerators or heaters, and backup generators must be checked on a regular basis. Make, the, make sure battery power devices are fully charged, have ample supply of all types of batteries available, and make a list of patients who use electric powered life-saving devices. You will not be able to download electronic patient care reports and cell phones and GPS may be out of service as well. Okay, so another man-made disaster is riots, civil disturbances, and stampedes. So dangers are multiplied when people are in a state of panic. Before and during the response, get as much information as possible about the scene and stay updated and maintain communication. Events change quickly. EMS considerations during riots, civil disturbances, and stampedes include scene safety or police presence prior to reporting to or setting up a staging area, determining what is happening right now and what could potentially happen. Also, vehicle safety. Do not drive over broken glass. And if the crowd is there, consider using a ground guide to walk in front of the slow moving vehicle. And then maintain situational awareness, such as use the buddy system and make sure you always have 360 degree view of the scene. Police escort and uh, wear body armor or helmet. Uh, documentation of anything you see at the scene that could later be used in a criminal or civil court. Also, strikes in labor disputes, so strikes can involve large or small groups of people and may last a long time. Some strikes or labor disputes involve disagreements and are generally peaceful. EMS considerations for strikes and labor disputes include should EMS providers cross a picket line? And if the patient is ambulatory, he or she might be brought safely to you. Television coverage of the event can act as a deterrent to physical or verbal attacks on EMS providers. So document and record all your findings. Sniper, shooter, or hostage situations. So EMS should be staged out of gun range in all shooter and sniper scenarios. If gunshot victims are still exposed, do not go to them. Um, make sure that you do not say anything to the press about the accident. And during the long standoff, do not lose your sense of urgency regarding communication security. When it comes to explosions, explosions can be intentional or unintentional. So EMS considerations for explosions include secondary or tertiary explosions that may have been placed and carefully record anything a seriously injured patient has to say. Ear injuries are common and air particles are probably contaminated. So your agency may consider setting up field hospitals if local hospitals are overwhelmed. Information technology disruption. So internet technology um, has helped EMS in many ways, but the downside is that hackers can penetrate EMS security and steal information. So every agency should have an information technology professional available to update the and test the system regularly. Use of the computer system should be limited to your agency and protect systems with passwords and change them frequently. 
And if you recognize a cyber threat, immediately report it to your supervisor and stop using the threatened browser or program. Okay. So that concludes Chapter 51 Disaster Response Lecture. Thank you for joining us this evening.